Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, tonight's PEP event is VTE and HE, right on the uh, heels of VTE and SHE last month. So now we're focused on the men and, and VTE. So thank you for joining. Uh, we have uh, multiple guests this evening. Uh, our medical um, participant is Dr. Rashad Patel. Excuse me, my nose is itchy. Uh, he is the director of benign hematology, research in hematology, and medical oncology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Uh, he is also an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he is the co-chair of the National Blood Clot Alliance Council of Emerging uh, Researchers. Uh, he is a great friend to the National Blood Clot Alliance, uh, works with us on a lot of our survey work, some research projects, and we are delighted to have him here with us this evening. Uh, and most importantly, he looks great in red wearing the NBCA vest. So thank you very much for, for <laughs> wearing that as well. Uh, that and, we, uh, and of course, uh, I'm joined by Todd Robertson, my pet partner, who I think a lot of folks know already. And Ted Mason, who is joining us from Michigan, who is a uh, blood clot survivor and is going to share uh, his story with all of us this evening uh, and with Todd. And there's going to be some interaction with Dr. Patel. So we're very informal. Dr. Patel, is it okay if we call you Rashad? Yes, please. Okay, please Rashad, Rashad it is. Okay, so before we get started, we're going to uh, do some poll questions, and I'm going to turn that over to you, Todd. Yes, I get to read the poll questions. Always fun to collect uh, some information from the patients. If you guys would please just quickly uh, mark down one of these answers. Question number one is popping up on your screen. What is your relation to blood clots? If, uh, are you a patient? Are you a caregiver, a healthcare professional, or other? If applicable, did you have a pulmonary embolism or a DVT, or did you have both? Uh, did you have a pulmonary embolism, DVT, or both, or neither? And maybe you're just here for informational purposes, and that's fine too. And the third question, have you ever experienced a mechanical thrombectomy? Yes, no. And have you ever been prescribed anticoagulation as in your blood thinner? Single choice. Yes or no. And back to Leslie. Okay, well, you're going to read the results, yes? Oh, yes, we are. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we do have to read the I keep forgetting those pop up. So let me scroll up here. That first question, what is your relation to blood clots? Patient was at 85%. 5% of you are a caregiver. 3% of you are healthcare professionals and 8% other. If applicable, did you have a pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, or both? 22% said PE, 19% said DVT, 46% said both. Wow. Have you ever experienced a mechanical thrombectomy? Yes, 13%, 74% said no. And have you ever been prescribed anticoagulation like your blood thinner? Yes, 84%. 16% say, no, they were not prescribed anticoagulation. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Todd. Interesting. Okay. So Rashad, uh, VTE and HE this is the title. And our first question will go out to you, which is, do men actually have a higher incidence of VTE? Um, I guess that could be DVT, PE, or both. Um, and if so, can you answer why that is? Uh, and we'd also like to know, there's a couple of parts here, so if you need me to repeat any of them, happy to do so. But does VTE manifest itself differently in men um, than in women? Does race play a role with men uh, as well? All right, thank you, Leslie. So I guess that the first question is perhaps uh, the key one today, which is, are men actually at increased risk for VTE? And I will say the answer is, perhaps not as straightforward as you would expect it. It's actually quite hard to dissect sex, gender, and something like VTE that is relatively common in general. Um, you know, where it sort of has fallen now is we do believe that men are at actually a higher risk than women, although there may be more women being diagnosed. So that sounds very confusing. And that's because there are certain risk factors that are very uh, specific for women, and that's like pregnancy and contraceptive use and hormone replacement therapy, which are very strong risk factors, highly prevalent in the population, uh, and therefore may be driving 
an equal or higher VT risk in women. But if you take them away, the belief is that men are at higher risk than women outside those circumstances. So intrinsically, uh, it seems that there is a higher risk for men. What's quite clear or what's well accepted is when you have one VTE in that, you know, we club DVT and PE in research together for the most part. So when you have one VTE event, uh, with the risk of having a second one, men seem to be at a higher risk than women. That part is clear. And in fact, there are some models where sort of the decision on length of anticoagulation, sex plays a role for that reason. So sort of like you know, if you're a man, and if you've had a VT event, the likelihood that you would need long-term anticoagulation is higher. There are some women that can be considered in some situations to have shorter anticoagulation. Obviously, we won't get into specifics, but that's sort of where sex plays a larger uh, clinical decision-making. So I think the answer is yes, but the caveats are these specific risk factors that happen only in women that are clearly strongly associated with VTE, sort of muddies the waters a little bit. And they, they do statistical modeling and FE to sort of like show this. Uh, but anyway, so that, that, sense, that answers your first question. Is the it, next, before yeah. you move forward, is there a difference between DVT and PE or is it just encompasses all VTE? Yeah, no, that in my mind encompasses uh, all VTE. So, you know, because a DVT, most PEs come from DVTs and lower extremity DVTs and some DVTs can be PEs, but some degree it's like whether you look or not, right? So you could have a DVT and then if you scan the chest, you could see a small, large PE. You have a PE, if you don't scan the legs, you'll never know whether or not there was a DVT. Sometimes you don't find a DVT, but then you believe that the DVT is broken off and gone into the lungs and so you won't see a DVT. So that's why they're sort of brought together uh, in clinical and in research work. Again, there are some sort of situations where it's sort of important to know what's going on. But for the most part, uh, when you talk about like incidents, recurrence, you know, first time, second time, we bring them together because for us that they are sort of created equal. Uh, their second question was, do they present differently? Uh, and the short answer is, we think not. Uh, we believe that, you know, if you look at like literature and if you compare sort of incidences, so the way you would do this is you would say, let's take a thousand men that have a, a DVT slash PE. Now, this is where the symptoms would matter because the symptoms of DVT and the symptoms of PE are quite different, right? The symptoms of a DVT are usually in the extremity where you see them. So it's like painful swelling, most commonly uh, of the leg, often of the calf, because that's where DVTs are usually seen. And a PE is usually shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, uh, air hunger, or dyspnea. And so uh, obviously the symptoms vary. But if you look at PE, DVT, PE, DVT, men versus women, you would want to see a thousand men and a thousand women. And you'd say, you know, is it more common to have shortness of breath versus chest pain in one sex versus the other? And so there are small differences if you sort of do these sorts of studies, but they are not substantial. And so in general, when we think of like education for patients or when we are trying to assess somebody with symptoms, whether or not they're a man or a woman and based on their symptoms has very little slash no consideration to these diagnoses. So again, I de I sort of dug in preparation for this one. I dug through it and I found like, you know, like two, three percentage differences. Those are not clinically very significant. So I would say they don't present differently. What's interesting though is, you know, this is what I meant, what's confusing. You know, are women being diagnosed with more VT than men, even though men are at greater risk? And there's some signals to suggest that might be true. So if you look at like research studies that just enroll VT patients, it seems like more women get enrolled on these studies than men. And that could be because there's sort of this bias again, because if you think of pregnancy, oral contraception, uh, hormone replacement therapy, when somebody presents with shortness of breath, like there is a, a clinical bias that a woman is at higher risk, even though actually the underlying risk seems to be stronger for men. So this is where the confusion comes from. Uh, so who gets diagnosed more? Uh, or earlier is, is again, not clear, but there is some debate and it does seem that there's a signal towards women compared to men. Mm -hmm. And what about the race factor? 
So again, I mean, race is clearly a risk factor for VTE and more specifically, it's uh, black men and women are at higher risk for VTE uh, than non-black or white uh, men or women within the races, the genders or the sexes. And I'm using the terms interchangeably, although that's incorrect. When we say sex, we're actually talking about like what you were assigned at birth, the sort of biological chromosomal uh, assignment. So the sex is not, or at least is not very clear, but there are clear racial uh, Asians have lower risk of VTE, Blacks have increased risk of VTE, and again, we are always using white, uh, the white population as the baseline because that is the majority, but you could argue whether that's even correct. So there are differences, at least not to my knowledge, of like very strong differences within uh, the gender. So whether it's Black men versus white women, that doesn't seem to be, you know, it's, it's driven by the race, not by the gender, if you look at those differences. Okay, and then I'm assuming um, as men age, uh, there's a higher incidence level just because the incidence goes up typically as people age, the population ages overall. So it's a very good one, uh, good point, and that's true in general. So VTE, you know, is less common in children, although it does happen. Uh, neonates, so very early, there's a higher risk, and that's sort of related to altered physiology. So. Uh, babies in their first month of life or preterm in uh, children are at higher risk. And then there's a low incidence rate like during childhood. And then it sort of peaks up as you get older. 70 is considered, you know, to be very high. So it's, uh, it's a geriatric age group, so 65 and above is at the is at the higher risk. Interestingly, again, if you think about those risk factors that I talked about, so like oral contraception, pregnancy, that usually happens to women during their childbearing. So that's between the age of 16 or 18 to 55. So it's at that time where uh, women seem to be at higher risk, again, and it's believed to be mostly driven by those transient risk factors that are very sex specific. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, so men are at higher risk. And then at a certain age, and it's whether it's 70, 75, or 80, it seems like the risk sort of equalizes. Uh, and to some degree, that's because men have a shorter lifespan than women. So they're just, so then you have death as a competing risk. So, you know, the statistics uh, sort of plays in. Sure. Um, and so most women have their VT actually older, even though we just talked about transit. This is what I mean when I say that these things are like very complicated to think about statistically, like incidents, populations and the transient risk factors. But yes, the older you get, the higher the risk. This is true for both men and uh, women. However, younger women have specific time periods and risk factors that uh, men don't have. And so that, that sort of has to get into the consideration of that kind of a question. Before, um, before I turn it over to Todd, just one more question. What is the, what um, implication does height have uh, in terms of uh, blood clot occurrence, because um, it does seem that some athletes in some particular sports, basketball, et cetera, but height and weight, how about that in terms of uh, influencing uh, VTE occurrence in men? So great question again. Um, and the answer is both play a role in uh, VTE risk. And this is actually, again, true for both men and women. But of course, men are uh, taller just on average and considerably taller than women. And so a long, in fact, a sort of accepted hypothesis is at least some of this higher incidence that we see in men or the higher risk that we see in men is driven because they're taller. And you can be like, what has that got to do with it? Well, you know, the blood has to sort of flow from your legs up to your heart. Uh, so it's flowing against gravity. So the taller you are, the longer the distance, the more the sort of pooling of blood and stasis, stasis that is within the veins of the leg. And that's sort of like one of the believe, strongly believed to be like one of the reasons why you develop those blood clots in your legs in the first place. So the taller you are, the distance is longer. Uh, so the longer your legs are, the, the, the veins are longer. And so there's just a higher risk of getting a clot in that region. So the answer is taller people actually are at increased risk of blood clots. Men are more likely to be taller. And at least some of this, if you sort of adjust for it, right? So if the same height, you just compare men and women of exactly the same height. Some of that increased risk for men goes away. So it's certainly a big contributing factor. 
Uh, weight is, of course, you know, uh, a, a huge risk factor because of how prevalent it is, obesity more specifically. So the more, the heavier you are, the higher the risk for VTE. And that's related to two things. One is, of course, sort of, um, you know, decreased activity, the morbidities that go like diabetes, heart disease, stroke, all the things that sort of make it more likely that you would develop a blood clot because they all sort of travel together. Uh, but then also the this, this story of inflammation and obesity, the distribution of the fat, sort of central obesity versus, you know, and, and, and that is, again, at least a hypothesis, which means that, you know, it's not fully accepted, but it's believed it could be playing a role and there are studies to sort of look at this, is that this could also maybe be driving it because clearly uh, men and women of, you know, exactly the same fat uh, content would still be distributed differently and where the fat is matters. If it's in the liver, if it's around in, in the belly, uh, the inflammation that it causes is different than sub-Q fat or fat under the skin. And so a uh, heavier man or woman, higher risk of ET, taller man or woman, higher risk of ET, but both height and weight are not the same in men and women. And so that's believed, or at least thought to be one of them. And you brought up sort of athletes. And so, you know, one thing that has also been played around is sort of, is the environment. And this is of course changing. Things are, are, are becoming, you know, more or less similar, but of course we're nowhere close to that yet. And if you just think of the sort of roles uh, traditionally, different sexes or genders have played in society and the type of jobs that they've played, that, you know, they've been thought to be different. So like, uh, also one study actually looked at this and I looked it up and I thought it was quite funny that even in the exact same job, men seem to sit on their ass more. So they're just more likely to be sedentary. And so maybe more likely to develop a blood clot, but perhaps more like teachers, nurses, these are professions that are on their feet. Even being a... Um, you know, a, a, a homekeeper or somebody that maintains the home, you're like constantly on your feet, uh, as opposed to somebody who's sitting in an office, which at least used to be mostly men. And so there was like, is that contributing? And I think, again, these things are so hard to sort of like tease out, you know, you also think of height, you also have to think of weight, you also have to think of other risk factors. So which one is contributing? But at least there's a theory that that could be uh, contributing. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Todd, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, I was going to ask you about height, too, because uh, I've noticed uh, over the last seven or eight years in support groups that I've run, and I've run several blood clot support groups, um, height usually came up. And, and my theory, and, and I don't know if this fits in, but my theory is I've seen a six foot five person sit on an airplane and I've seen a five foot four person sit on an airplane and I've seen their legs side by side. And when you have that tall person with the legs totally crushed together and bent, which is much more than the shorter person, I think that cuts off the circulation. And so that height in, in that respect, that that really does affect the circulation part. So I, I can see that where that would be an issue. A couple of real quick questions, because I don't want to cut in on the time for the patient stories. I just want to mention non-compliance real quick. And the reason I bring it up is because this is something else I see in the support groups all the time including hours at the MBCA. Uh, once in a while, you'll see patients who miss two or three days worth of their doses and they don't think of it as a big deal. And so they tell other patients, you know, it's probably not a big deal that you miss a dose or two. Um, I've talked to pharmacists, I've talked to my own doctors, my own hematologists, and they say noncompliance is an issue. Um, <clears throat> but I, I always thought, you know, maybe because we're guys, maybe we're a little bit more stubborn and maybe we think we can get away with more. I really don't know. But I know that, I've seen a lot of men uh, missing their doses and sadly being okay with it. So I just wanted to see if that figured in at all to reoccurrence as far as people reclotting. I mean, if you don't take your dough out correctly, the chances of it working drop significantly, I would think, right? So yes, I would start with what I know. And the last thing you said is exactly what we know that, you know, the TOAX, which is uh, Apixaban, Rivaroxaban, Edoxaban, or Eliquis, Zeralto, et cetera, the trade names are uh, amazing medications. And, you know, they've now been on the scene for like 10 years and they work really, really well. Uh, and you don't need to monitor them, which used to be what had, we had to do with warfarin, uh, which we still use sometimes. Uh, and you don't have to inject yourself, which is what we had to do with the heparins, which we still use sometimes, but by far the most prescribed med anticoagulants are now the DOACs. Mm -hmm. And for everything that they're great with, 
They're also very short acting. And so even missing a single dose means you're now not protected. There's a pro and a con. So if you suddenly need an urgent surgery, you can go for it in a few hours because if you stop taking the drug, it's now okay to go and get the surgery. So this is like the plus. If you start bleeding, just holding the dose is usually enough because the drug sort of has a short half-life and it washes out. So mm -hmm. the same things that make it them very advantageous also, however, mean that if you skip even one or two doses, you are now unprotected. And so depending on then the underlying sort of risk profile, the risk of uh, a recurrent VT increases. What I don't know, and I don't know if this literature, or maybe I'm just not aware of it, is if the adherence or the compliance rates are actually different from men or women. Now, you know, you, what you say is sort of rings true, seems anecdotally to be true, mostly because of me, because I don't take anything twice a day. Um, and I think the women that I know and are in my life are much more particular, but this is sort of like perception. Sure. Uh, and I don't know if it's actually been like uh, studied. Well, th th thank you for that. Um, but the main question I wanted to ask you before we before we move on is, we've been talking about getting a blood clot. What about treatment? So for those of us that are on anticoagulants, is there a weight threshold for anticoagulation? And how do you determine the dosage if that is indeed fact? It's a very, uh, another good question, one that comes up quite often. So we talked, a, I, I brought up sort of the different types of anticoagulants and it's sort of, it's again, the same point, which means that, you know, warfarin was a really annoying medicine uh, that you dose to levels. So everybody gets a different dose and you sort of check the blood level and you know whether or not. Uh, mm -hmm. What was good about that though was you could titrate to every person. So like small, large, you know, some people need it more, some people need less. It wasn't just about size. It's about metabolism, diet, all sorts of things used to factor into it. And you had to titrate. Inoxaparin or heparin or Lovenox is actually dose by weight. So larger people get higher doses. The beauty or the wonderful thing about DOAX or the way they were designed uh, is that it's a fixed dose. It does not really matter what you weigh. There's some exception. You know, there's a lower dose for a big saban if you have an altered renal function and you're smaller and or you're older. But for the most part, sort of a blanket dose for everyone. Again, makes it really easy, makes it very simple to sort of prescribe, which is probably why they really like designing a drug like that. But it also makes it very easy to take. It's very hard to like make a mistake. There's a loading dose usually for seven days for a Pixaban and three weeks for Ivaroxaban. But after that, it's sort of a fixed dose. However, the concern is if you're really low weight or if you're really high weight, obviously the same dose is going to sort of distribute differently in a different body. It's like a really small glass of water and a really large glass of water. If you put the same amount of sugar in them, one's going to be much sweeter than the other. Obviously not as simple as that. We're not big glasses of water, but we so, sort of are. We're mainly water and fat. It, That's yeah. what we have. Uh, and so, but the bottom line is this. So, so initially they excluded patients from studies when they, when they had a really high BMI for this concern. And retrospectively in real world data, they've actually looked at, you know, because we often have to use drugs, even if they were not studied like that. And they seem to be safe. So, you know, it's sort of is tailored. I... For the most part, I'm okay with it. But if I have somebody with a really bad, you know, PE or a really high risk or somebody who's had multiple blood clots uh, and they are obese or even not just obese, but sort of super obese, which means their BMI is really high, I might hesitate. I also have no standard way of checking to make sure that they're anticoagulated enough with a direct oral anticoagulant. So there's some hesitation. Other things to consider that are related to weight is if somebody's had bariatric surgery, absorption can be very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's something that we think okay. about uh, as to whether we whether we really want to use a direct oral anticoagulant or whether we really want to use it in the acute or the short term because that's the highest risk. Period. So right after you've had the clot, you might want to avoid one. And then mm -hmm. six months in, you know, when the risk is lower and you're trying to maintain or prevent another blood clot, we, I, I would go to a DOAC. But this is patient by patient. So this great, is great, great answers. Thank you, Rashad. Okay, so now we're going to get to the really interesting part. So uh, we have, as I mentioned, uh, Ted Mason is here this evening. Uh, Ted, thank you for coming and for willing to share your story. 
Um, I'm going to ask you to take a few minutes to share your story with everybody here tonight. And then Rashad I would love for you to comment on uh, Ted's story. I think there might be some back and forth between the two of you. Um, explain a little bit about what he had specifically and the treatment that he used, but why he still also uh, is on anticoagulation. So with that, Ted, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself to everybody and share your story. Okay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, Awareness is everything. Uh, I have to admit, I knew very little about blood clots until uh, they almost killed me. So uh, <laughs> that was kind of my motivation to learn. Um, so on December 26th of 2022, uh, I, I hadn't been feeling well for a couple of days. I had some pain in my lower left calf, which I thought was because I was running too hard at the gym uh, a few days prior. Uh, but I knew I wasn't feeling well, and Christmas was on Sunday that year, so Monday, everything was closed. So it was the day after Christmas, and I decided I should call my primary care doctor because I knew something was, was wrong. And uh, I was vacuuming up cat litter, which saved my life because at that point, I got dizzy, and I couldn't breathe, and I had severe pain in my chest, and I was thinking, okay, I need to sit down and have my wife call an ambulance. And then the next thing I was just like, I think I'm, I think I'm having a heart attack and I passed out. My wife found me face planted on the floor. Uh, my glasses broke, cut my forehead, found me unconscious in a pool of blood. Um, we didn't know what happened. She, uh, thank the Lord, she called 911. We went to the hospital. Uh, they checked me for several things. They kept asking me about flights, car rides, smoking. Uh, I smoked in my 20s, but I was 55 at the time. I hadn't had a cigarette in almost 30 years. So um, they were kind of like puzzled as to what was going on with me until I mentioned my calf pain. And that was like a light going on for the ER staff. They said, well, let's give you a CT with dye. And they took me out. And they did that. And uh, about 10, 15 minutes later, the nurses came in my room. And in hindsight, they probably were looking a little scared. Um, but they came in and they're like, oh, well, you have a blood clot, Mr. Mason, so we're going to start you on heifer, and we're going to have to admit you. So I'm like, okay. So my wife and uh, daughter and son-in-law went home then, and I'm grateful they did because shortly after that, the cardiologist on duty came in my room, and she said, uh, Mr. Mason, but for the grace of God, we don't know why you're still here. Um, you have a huge clot. Uh, you have a pulmonary embolism. Um, you need surgery but you're not stable enough for surgery so we're going to take you right to the ICU and get you stabilized um so uh but after about 24 hours I had this uh, thrombectomy uh Wednesday morning um and I could breathe better right after the, the surgery I was awake for the surgery and I I was feeling better when I got done I could just feel my breathing was better um and the nurses in the operating theater were just kind of ooing and aahing um, as the surgeon was taking out this blood clot. And I was like, well, what's going on? And there's, they said, well, we've never seen a clot this big in anybody that was that survived. Um, and I had them take a picture of it for me. Uh, it ended up being um, a foot long. And um, I found out later that it was actually a saddle PE. Um, which at the time I'd never heard of it, but uh, it was a saddle PE. And the day be before my surgery, when I just was in the ICU, I remember hearing a few nurses talking outside my room. And one of the nurses was like, is this the guy? And the other one says, yeah. He says, how the hell is this dude even alive? And he said, I don't know. It's a miracle, man. Um, so they started calling me the miracle man because I lived through that. And, uh, they told me I had enough clots to kill a dozen people. I ended up having uh, multiple DVTs in my legs, uh, multiple PEs. Um, they only, the thrombectomy only took out the saddle because that was, that was the one that was causing me the most danger. My, uh, my heart acts, the right side of my heart is actually enlarged to four times its normal size. Um, I was very blessed that I had been working out probably the last six or seven years. 
the doctor said the fact that I was in pretty good shape probably allowed me to survive that. Um, the, I ended up with, as far as I know, uh, my follow-up appointments had not shown any kind of uh, damage to my heart or my lungs. So uh, the recovery has gone a little slow at times, but I've been, I was off work for five months. Uh, I'm an eldest lifer now because they said my clots were unprovoked. Um, and when my hematologist said, you're going to be an eloquist lifer, I said, well, we were going to fight if you said we weren't, uh, because I'd, I'd done enough reading in the hospital to know that that was my best chance to not have another uh, incident uh, of clotting. Um, so, yeah, I was just very, very blessed. God was, God's hand was on me that night. The only reason I'm here to share this story, so. Probably. And I was texting people from the hospital bed, all the guys I know, if you have pain in your left calf, call your <laughs> doctor right away. <laughs> well, you're and, a walking Ted, billboard now, so. We yeah, thank you that. Ted, I just, I just want to say I'm glad you brought up the part about um, being in shape and feeling stronger when you got to that point, because that did probably help you out as far as surviving and uh, also through recovery. And that's why I tell people getting in shape and stuff. Yeah, that'll that'll help prevent some blood clots, but it's being ready for that next battle. Right. And you were ready for it in a sense. And it, yeah, it yeah. You. So, yeah, I'm just glad you brought that up now. Yeah, I didn't know what I was training for, but it ended up being uh... <laughs> a life a lifesaver. Yeah. Being that. Being yeah. A saddle PE. So I, what I'd like to do now is, Rashad, if you, you've heard Ted's story, explain to us what is a saddle PE? You know, is this highly unusual? How does it get treated? Are you seeing more thrombectomies these days? Like, what do you do when a high-risk patient shows up like Ted? Sure. So I guess I'm going to start with a very basic anatomy class which is that what is a PE? So a PE is when a blood clot breaks off and travels to the lungs. And then, you know, essentially the way it goes is the veins from the legs. And most of you have seen these figures, but just think about them. They're like this inverted Y. So these are the veins from the legs. They go up. They become this major blood vessel, which is called the inferior vena cava, which is like a solid pipe that's taking all the blood from the lower extremities as well as the abdomen and delivering it into the heart. And then the heart pumps that blood into the lungs where it has to get the oxygen and then comes back to the heart and then the heart pumps it back. So that's sort of like what's happening. So that's why the blood clot goes to the lungs because all the blood is sort of going through the heart to the lungs to get oxygenated. So if there's a clot uh, in these leg veins, they break off and they can go, they can go. There's nothing really impairing them from going through the heart and into the lungs. Once they're in the lungs, Again, think about sort of a figure, but basically what the artery has to sort of break up and essentially become like a tree. So like one blood vessel becomes a smaller blood vessel, becomes a smaller blood vessel, becomes a smaller blood vessel, and literally looks like, you know, two trees, two branches, which are becoming a tree. The reason why it has to do that is because the blood has to really get really close to the air. So it's like a fine mesh at the very end. That's how it gets its oxygen. But a blood clot will not, is too big to sort of pass through that fine mesh and it gets stuck. And that's what a PE is. So that's why so the, the, the lung, the blood vessel network in the lung essentially acts like a fine mesh or a net, which then catches these blood clots that are flowing in the blood. And when you have a very large blood clot, uh, it doesn't really have to go very far into the mesh. So basically the you know, the first thing that happens is the main pulmonary artery, which is this main blood vessel, breaks off and goes right and left because you have two lungs, your right lung and your left lung. And so it has like the one blood vessel becomes two. If the blood clot's really big, it gets stuck right there. You know, sort of like in the main highway, right at the like right at the fork. That's a saddle PE because it sort of saddles that junction. Uh, and so Again, hard to sort of explain uh, with just my hands, but basically a large blood vessel that goes and sits at the junction for the right and left main pulmonary artery is called a saddle PE. What it means then is that you have a, an obstruction uh, to both your right lung and your left lung, uh, and it's large enough to sit there. 
And so it can have a serious effect on sort of the hemodynamics or your blood pressure or the ability of your heart, because now your heart is sort of working against this dam that's not letting the blood flow forward. And it, it A, decreases the blood, sort of the amount of blood that's flowing. So there's less blood going into your lungs, there's less oxygen flowing in your body, but also there's a dyna uh, there's a mechanical problem. The heart can't really push out blood that much. And so it's working in overtime and it leads to heart failure, acute sudden heart failure. So your blood pressure drops uh, because the heart can't keep up with that kind of an obstruction. Um, and so a saddle PE doesn't mean the blood pressure drops, but the blood pressure usually drops when there's a lot of significant clot and a saddle PE leads to a lot of significant clot. And sort of just, you know, you guys were talking about this Obviously, all this, if you have a weakened heart to begin with, are not in the best health, it's just more likely to happen. Or if you smoked a lot and your lungs already had COPD or emphysema or asthma, like it's it's less likely to be able to take even a small clot because it, it, it's sort of working already on reserve. So even a small clot will make the oxygen go down. So the underlying milieu or the you know the 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 status of the health of the person will impact even besides the size of the clot, it also matters on like the underlying health. Now you asked me about like, where does the thrombectomy come in? So basically if there's a very large clot and it's actually not defined by the size of the clot, it's actually defined by the effect of the clot. So a clot that leads to a low blood pressure is called a severe PE uh, because that's like, it's, it's big enough as well as it takes into account like how strong is the heart and how strong is the body. Because both those things come together and they lead to that effect. So if you have like low blood pressure or you're in shock, that's severe PE, uh, and that leads to the need. You can't just give somebody anticoagulants or blood thinners and wait, because if you just sit and give blood thinners and wait, the heart is gonna sort of collapse. Uh, and so you have to actually do something faster. And there's two things you can do. You can do thrombolysis, which is you actually inject medicine which is this clotlizing or dissolving medicine, which is not a blood thinner, it's different. And you sort of inject it in and that can quickly dissolve the clot versus you literally go in and pull out the clot. That's a thrombectomy. So a mechanical thrombectomy is mechanically removing the clot. Why do you choose which one? All this now depends on like patient, the location of the clot, the uh, ability of the center. So not all centers can do a mechanical thrombectomy, uh, you know, some centers can and some centers can't. You don't need a specialized uh, multidisciplinary team. You need a hematologist, a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, an interventional radiologist. Everybody has to be there to do that kind of a procedure. And so a smaller center won't even have that. So obviously all that matters. Uh, but that's a mechanical thrombectomy. Are we seeing more and more of them? Uh, I think our abilities are going up, sort of like we have more people trained, you know, larger centers are becoming more aware. I'm sure you guys have heard of PERT teams, uh, or at least Leslie, I know you have, and I'm sure some people, that, I mean, but a PERT team is basically that it's a fancy name for that multidisciplinary team. Uh, so for example, at BI, where I work, there's a pager and you literally get paged and it can be at any time and nobody rushes into the hospital anymore, but you basically rush to a computer and you open up and everybody's sort of on a Zoom call and we're looking at the patient chart and they're talking about like the patient, here are the scans, here's what's going on, what should we do? And a decision is made in real time about like what's the next best step. And so different there are different versions of this in different hospitals. But um, so sort of that has come and that certainly has come to the light. As you know, there's a, you know, there's a PERT national consortium. They're trying to increase the number of PERT teams, sort of improve the research and availability of these things. And of course, there's lots of technology being developed in terms of how invasive, you know, newer devices to actually do this. Uh, so yes, I think the they're increasing. We still reserve them for se severe or almost severe. So either if somebody's in shock or we're concerned that they're going to go into shock. Shock is when your blood pressure is so low, there's not enough blood flowing, you know, uh, for vital organ function uh, is when it's generally considered. Other pay, because there are risks of going in and starting pulling out people's clots. There's bleeding risk. There's, you know, while you're breaking off that clot, you can actually make them smaller and they can go further down. And then you can't really rescue them because like you can't really go into every small blood vessel and take little clots out. Uh, and so they're reserved for when you absolutely need them or you think, and that sounds like your case, Ted, is like, you know, when there's when a situation- Oh, oh yeah, really... absolutely. The, uh, the surgeon, 
met with me and my wife and he explained the procedure and he said, it's, it's a risky procedure. And he said, quite honestly, uh, it's riskier to not do it in my case. So, uh, yeah, and I was like, well, I'm all for anything saving my life. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's do it. And you were awake. Yes. They asked me, I'm, I'm sure I had some kind of local, but, um, I was awake because they needed me to uh, at different points and uh, hold my breath to try and stretch my lungs out. And uh, sometimes they need me to take a deep breath and hold it. Um, I, I was on my back. I was flat on my back for a couple of days. So I couldn't see anything that was going on. Uh, thank the Lord. Um, and I believe they do it with an, uh, some sort of x-ray to guide the uh, surgeon. Uh, they went into the big vein in my leg. Um, they put in a catheter that felt like it was the size of a garden hose. Um, I'm sure it wasn't that big. And they went up through there and uh, through the heart to get it out. And uh, I'm, I'm just grateful I happened to live near a good hospital and they had the uh, capability to do that procedure. It, it saved my life. So it's exactly. So that's way, that's how the clot goes and that's how the catheter goes. Right? So the clot goes from the legs up through the heart into the lungs. So they're basically like following the clot pulling it out uh, as they go. And again, the specifics of the procedure, of course, uh, vary. And it's not really a surgery. There is something called an open thrombectomy. You literally open up the chest and you take the clot out. But, you know, technology has moved, so they no longer need to do that. So they're, they're usually these kind of guided uh, camera or more commonly, like you were saying, with so they're basically pushing in dye to visualize the clot and pull it out at the same time. That's what that's what the x-rays were. Um, a similar procedure is done when you have a, a heart attack. That time the clot's like in the blood vessel supplying the heart, but they're going in, they're sort of taking out the clot and they're putting in a stent. They don't put stents in for peas because the main blood vessels are large enough. They don't need stents. They just There's just clot there that needs to come out. So they take it out. And then you always follow that up with anticoagulants or blood thinners. And that's because, you know, if a clot's formed or even there's a little bit of clot left, um, it's the body's beautifully designed to sort of prevent bleeding. So, you know, if you cut your fingers, a small clot forms, and then that leads to larger clot. That's how people don't bleed out with every tiny little clot. But unfortunately, in thrombosis is sort of the pathology or like when that goes wrong. And so a little bit of clot can actually start this chain reaction and lead to more clot. So what the anticoagulant or the blood thinner does, it sort of shuts that process down. So it prevents the clot from growing. So you definitely need that in as well. It's so a sort of usually a thrombectomy, is, not usually, I think always, a thrombectomy is accompanied with anticoagulation, which I know you got as well. It's usually IV to begin with. I'm sure you were on a heparin drip, and then you're transitioned uh, to an oral anticoagulant like for long time. Yeah, that's uh, exactly what happened, the heparin drip, and then they transitioned, uh, they transitioned me to Eliquis while I was still in the hospital, and I continued on it. And just to follow up on what you and Todd were talking about earlier about compliance, I missed one dose of my Eloquist about a month after I was out of the hospital and I thought I was going to have a panic attack. So I started using the pill bottle and I set alarms on my phone for 12 hours apart. Take my morning dose, um, take my evening dose. Um, that way I don't miss it. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really important. It's a, it's a great medication. I'm so grateful that I, I have it, that it's here. Uh, but you have to take it, and it's a it's a small thing to do, just to to save your life. I mean, I'm, that pill every day, I'm I'm literally helping to save my life another day by taking my medication the way and, it's prescribed. And, and thank and thanks for saying that, Ted, because we've all missed a dose. Crap happens. Th th things yeah. happen. You miss a dose. But but if you're into a habit of missing doses, you need to break the habit before something happens. And that's a development of a blood clot. You know, I, I've just seen it too many times, but thanks again for, for bringing that up. And I, I'm just, I'm so stoked to have you here and tell your story. Uh, people are really excited about having you here because uh, uh, they're, they're mentioning uh, that they like hearing this stuff firsthand from the survivor. And it's a very fresh event for you. Um, so your emotion and the things that you talk about, it's really important. And other people listening to this, it really helps them and it can save a life. So Ted, I just want to thank you, and I'm so glad you accepted the offer of coming on Pep Talk. Um, I'm glad you asked me. Um, I kind of felt like one of the reasons that God spared my life was 
maybe just so I could help somebody else. If one person hears this and they go to the doctor or they take their medication or they get a clot diagnosed before it gets too bad, then this is 100% worth it. That's right. That's right. Amen. Um, I'm curious, Rashad, when, <clears throat> when Ted travels now, he's unprovoked. We talked about that earlier. He's on an anticoagulant. Um, sounds like he's tolerating it quite well. But Ted, when you travel, if you fly for a long distance or drive for a long distance, do you keep the same dosage or um, Rashad, if you had a patient like this and you're not here to give medical advice and I want to preempt that right now, but I'm just curious, a patient like Ted, would you encourage them to up the dosage if they're traveling a long distance or take any other precautions? Uh, sure, Leslie. Um, I think you did use the word unprovoked. And I just think that, you know, I know you think about blood clots now more than I do every day, but just so that everybody else knows like what that means is we think of the, what we're really trying to get at is what's the risk of this clot coming back? And so if the, if we had the exact same story, but Ted started by saying, I had a hip replacement and you know, five days later, this story happened. We then think that really what happened is the hip replacement, that surgery, from which for many reasons actually does increase the risk of blood clots, is what drove this blood clot to form in the legs and it led to the lungs. And why is that important? Why that's important is because hopefully people that have one hip replacement don't go on, keep getting them every few months. And so that sort of event that drove it, the provoking factor happened but it's not going to happen again. And so the risk of it coming back is lower than somebody, unfortunately, like Ted, but it came out of the blue, which means that whatever caused it is not something that we could identify that we can avoid or be careful about around. And so that's what's an unprovoked, as in no provoking factor, known provoking factor. There's still probably a factor. We just don't know what those factors are. Um, and so we think of them differently. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Um, the and the but however the, the exact question that you asked me is what happens for travel and I think again without get, giving medical advice the sort of blanket answer is being on an anticoagulant is sufficiently protective that's how we think of it to prevent another blood clot even with long travel we have certain like general recommendations you know stay hydrated stay mobile don't just stay seated uh, you know. Uh, try and walk around, whatever, whatever, like all those general recommendations, all very important and you, you know, should do them. But by the, for the most part, blood thinners are very effective. We have really good ones now. We've talked about some of them. They may even be newer ones coming soon. Uh, and those clearly are going to be enough. I do not recommend increasing the dose. I don't add aspirin uh, to people, you know, if they're already on Eliquis or Epixaban, I don't say start an aspirin. Even if they're on lower doses, because now that has sort of become the thing. So, you know, after a certain short term, so three months or six months, we often drop the dose to half to sort of prevent another blood clot. I do not go up to five milligrams uh, of a pixaban, which would be sort of the full dose uh, anticoagulation um, in general. Now, if you have a second blood clot, I normally would, you know, on 2.5, I probably will not go back down to 2.5. I'll keep you on five milligrams. I would say, yes, of course, you, we're not trying to hold you, but you need to be even extra careful. So I, I do think this sort of gets individualized. It also matters where you are in your journey. So the risk is clearly very high right after the blood clot. It's also very high right after discontinuing a blood thinner. And I know this is like a bad word now, but there are situations where we say, okay, you know, sometimes it's patient preference. Sometimes it's based on professions. Like, you know, they, they cannot continue anticoagulation indefinitely. And if it was like a provoked, incident after a surgery we'd be like i think it's okay now if you we can stop the anti so we stop the anticoagulant and it's that time right after you stop it where the risk is really high for another clot to happen and it's about three six months or one year so if you're off it and now you're two years three years four years five years out it's probably unlikely that you're now going to have a clot or it's less likely that you're going to have a clot so okay. i think all that matters as well so you know if somebody's just stopped it and now they want to go i don't know to thailand uh I would be more <laughs> hesitant and I would say probably we should restart the anticoagulant or at least take something with you. But if they had a blood clot 10 years ago, they've been off anticoagulation for five years now, 
I would just use the general precautions. I think that's sort of like how we do it. So we know you're taking a long trip soon. You're going to Thailand and we want to make sure that you stay safe. Are you going to be in coach or are you going to be upgraded to first class? Uh, we, worry, we worry about you. I will try and make the case uh, to have me upgraded, but no, I'm flying coach. However, it is a thrombosis hemostasis <laughs> conference. So a lot of people in the plane and in Bangkok, Bangkok is going to have the highest concentration of coagulation doctors ever. I'm pretty sure from around the world. So pretty hopefully sure that too. makes it a little safe. Because <laughs> it would be really bad form to show up with a, a DVT. A bad a blood clot. Indeed it would. All right. I know we're we're running late, but we've got Ted, thank you so much for sharing this. This has been simply amazing. Um we're gonna now uh switch over to Todd, who also has uh and quite a remarkable story. So Todd, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, in some ways, because he's been so great about uh, messaging about this, suffered another uh, blood clot recently. So he's a seven-time blood clot survivor. So, Todd, could you take a few moments and share your story with, with Rashad? Yeah, and a lot of people in the support group, a lot of people online already know bits and pieces of my story. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, so I'm going to give you the the full throttle version, which is going to be pretty short, but I do want to just mention, just going back to the compliance thing real quick. Okay. we got people having trouble remember to take their meds and stuff. I just want to recommend, uh, this is the pill box that I have. Okay. And the reason I like this pill box is because it has both AM and PM pods, but look at the pods. Okay. They're very narrow. They can fit into your pocket. So if you have to travel, you're going to work, you need to take your pill with you, keep it in the pod. Um, just pill boxes are really good things to have. So do that, set your alarms, whatever you need to do to break that habit of missing your doses. Uh, real quick about my story. So yeah, I just had my seventh blood clot, but it, you know the story really can't begin. And I'm going to try to give you the five minute version or less. It really can't begin without talking about my mother who I lost when she was 43 years old. So I was growing up in a single parent household. I was still in high school. I was the only one with a job. So I was in high school. I had a job to support me and my mother because my, my dad had left long before. And uh, one day she called me at work and was complaining of chest pains. And don't ask me why, because as a kid, you know, I don't know why I didn't call an ambulance. I don't know why I didn't jump on her and ask her why she didn't call an ambulance. All I know is she called me. And uh, I went home and uh, picked her up and was taking her to the hospital. This was uh, in the early 80s. Um, and we didn't make it four blocks down the street. We were having a conversation. She stopped having a conversation. I looked over and her lips were blue. And so right then, everything in my world changed. And it, 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 I mean, to this point, that was the turning point for me because I lost my only living relative and my only parent and was basically on my own from that point forward. Now, I heard the words blood clot at the hospital. Uh, when I was taken into taken into to look at her on the table, which was a very difficult thing, I heard the doctors talking about blood clots. But to be frank, I, I didn't care. It, it, it wasn't what happened to her. All I knew is that I was alone. I was without her. OK, she died of a blood clot. Now, fast forward several decades. And uh, I started to connect the dots because I suffered my first blood clot in 2011 after falling backwards off of a canoe trailer. I was loading a canoe on the top of a, a, a rack. I fell over backwards. The rack went into my leg, ripped it open, and I was literally hanging upside down like a caught fish. I was also in a very remote area. I tried calling the sheriff, but there was no phone signal. Actually, I had the sheriff on the phone. The phone cut out. Um, I thanked God for my wilderness first aid training because I had to use a self tourniquet. I used a stick. I used my belt. I uh, put the tourniquet on, drove myself to the ER. And um, this was before I had a blood clot. Okay. This is just the trigger event that started the train rolling. Um, ended up having a blood clot uh, about a month later. Uh, there was no surgery. They just patched me up. They cleaned out this wound. It was a really bad gash. I was in the bathroom a couple of months later, just going to the bathroom. I looked down at my foot and my foot was purple. And I knew something was wrong because I had just watched my wife die from brain cancer in hospice. As her body shut down, she had splotches of purple all over her body. So I saw my foot and boom, I knew that wasn't good. So I went, I actually drove myself, probably shouldn't have, but I drove myself immediately to the ER, had a blood clot. 
was in the hospital for 10 days because they could not get warfarin in range and they were really uncomfortable about sending me home. So I spent my birthday and the next 10 days in the hospital, uh, eventually got warfarin under control, went home. Over the next nine months, I suffered two more blood clots while on warfarin. So they moved me to Xeralto, which had just been um, approved by the FDA. Uh, so had another blood clot, had one found in my groin. We don't know where that one came from. Even when it popped up, they were looking for something else. The pulmonary embolism came by in 2017. I threw that clot because of improper anticoagulation while uh, getting a colonoscopy. And, and now I may be wrong. I may be wrong, Rashad, but, but I, I should have been a better advocate because I should have caught the flag that was raised. There I was, homozygous, I'd already had five clots, homozygous factor five Leiden, and they stopped my anticoagulation for three days. That should have been a, a warning to me. Uh, anyway, a couple days later after the colonoscopy, and hey, yeah, the colonoscopies literally saved my butt because they're always cutting out polyps, but we will never do another colonoscopy with me removed from Xeralto for more than 24 hours, unless there's a bridge. Okay, so that was about three days off. I got the got the clot, and then last month, um, it looked like things were going fine. I'm always really good with my Zeralto. I, I love that anticoagulant. I think it's it, it really does work like a charm when it's in your system. So I had another minor procedure last month, and I was off for two days. No bridge. I was taken off for two days. So it wasn't the three days that gave me the PE, but it was just two days. Well, my calf started hurting a few days later. It's not my first rodeo. I, I know the difference between a calf sprain, overworking in the gym, and a blood clot. I, I just can tell the difference. So I took myself in. A doctor gave me an ultrasound, found the seventh blood clot. So when I'm not on Xeralto, I clot like a truck's tailpipe in quicksand. When I am on Xeralto, I'm living the dream, and I, I don't have blood clots. So I mean, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Yeah, I've had a lot of blood clots, but I trust Zeralta completely. I, I manage my risk factors very well. I'm over the health anxiety, the post-clot PTSD that I was diagnosed with back in 2017, which was combined with compounded grief because of the wife's death. It all just kind of piled up on me. I went through counseling. I've managed that. I'm having a wonderful life. I don't have any fear of blood clots. I know they're bad but I feel like I'm doing a good job at preventing them. And my whole thing right now is there may be a, an eighth blood clot. Sure. Th there might be for any number of reasons, but I'm going to be uh, strong and fit for the recovery going into it. I'm going to do as, you know, what I can to, to make myself have an easier recovery. And uh, I, I think I'm just ready for it. Look, I'm riding mountain bike. I'm rock climbing. I'm skydiving from 14,000. I'm having a good time. And I'm, I'm, I'm careful as I do things, but I'm also living my life on Zeralto. And I hope that gives a little hope to other people that are just getting diagnosed and going on blood thinners, thinking that their life is over. It's not. It, it, it's not. Um, you can continue to live, get blood clot educated, bone up on all the knowledge that you can. And thank God for the National Blood Clot Alliance, because that's who I found when I was going through all that in 2017. I found the NBCA, and now they've helped give me a voice instead of just running random support groups. I've got a support group running on the NBCA site that's doing very well. We've got a lot of patients who are finally getting the knowledge and the support that they deserve. And addressing and the emotional impact also. And most definitely, most definitely. But just like I told Ted, Ted sharing his story, saving a life. If, if I can save one life, Ted, just like you said, one life out of all of them over a period of years, I'll be happy with that. But I, think we're, but, I th but, but I think we're saving more, right? Because people cl are clotting left and right, like they always have been, but they need the MBCA. They need patients to share their story. And I want a lot of the uh, patients out there now that are listening to share their story as well. We put up a link for you in the chat. Would love to hear your story as well. But that's my story, Rashad. I, you know, blood clots threw me for a loop, but now I, I think I, I kind of have a handle on it, especially emotionally, which I think helps physically too. So, so and plus Rashad, I, plus I lost 80 pounds, which, which wasn't bad. That, that helped me feel a lot better. So Rashad, a couple, a couple of things, and I know we're bumping up against the timeline here. So um, uh, I want to be mindful of your time this evening. A couple of things. One is factor five lighting. If you could explain what that is for the group, because maybe some people aren't aware of it, what it means. Um, Cause some people can have it and not clot. Uh, and then the second thing is, you know, 
uh, Ted and Todd and all of us have to go in for procedures. Colonoscopy might be one of them. How do you deal with your your patients uh, when they have to have these types of procedures? Sure. Um, so I guess the first question is factor five lightning. And so, you know, it sort of comes back to why do people even thought? Why does this happen? And clotting is natural. You need to clot if you're going to go surgery. If you, you know, go rock climbing and scrape your knee, you don't want to bleed out on the rock. So your body has to clot. And so again, when we talk about blood clots, we're talking about the unnatural or abnormal blood clots that just happen in the blood in the body where they're not supposed to in a healthy way and go on. And there are many, many, many reasons why blood clots. This is what makes it more. There's no like one cause. And we, that's why we call them risk factors because we consider them to be like several factors. And uh, an interesting way when I explain to the patients is that they add up and they don't just add up. They seem to multiply together. So, you know, if you're overweight and you smoke and you have cancer and you're now hospitalized and you, and you don't move and you decide to take a trip to Thailand in that state, your risk is like going up because all those risk factors come together. So besides, the, and, and you decide to get a hip replacement in Thailand while you're there and fly back. So that would be like the perfect storm. The perfect storm, it's, right? Yeah. It's literally the yeah. perfect storm. Oh. But there are risk factors that you can't control or that don't come sort of from things that you do or what you have. And um, those are the genetic ones, the ones that you're sort of born with. Um, and we know at least five that we consider to be the big five and i'm not going to go into them because they'll just be names but like essentially clotting is a very complicated process and so normal clotting you know the body has to make sure that the blood is not clotting sort of like while it's flowing through and yet it starts clotting right when it needs to when it clots and the way it does that is through this complex interplay of cells and proteins so there's these proteins that basically become gel when they need to when they need to form the clot but that's done through a series of sort of chain reactions where the proteins modulate. The reason why I'm saying that is because there are so many proteins involved, it means that you can have something wrong with many of those proteins that can lead to abnormal bleeding or abnormal clotting. And that's a, sort of a big part of what bleeding and clotting medicine is all about. Factor five is actually a normal coagulation factor. It's a protein that you need to develop a clot. But if you have a mutation in the gene that codes for factor five, that then leads to a factor five that's abnormal factor five or hyperactive factor five, it makes it makes it sort of the balance between not bleeding and not clotting is thrown in favor of clotting. And those people become much more prone to clot because their factor five is just super factor five or like act, super active factor five. And the stops and measures are not enough in the body to sort of prevent then a clot from forming. So that's sort of how it's designed. Um, now, everybody has two chromosomes. You inherit one from your mom and one from your dad. So if there's a mutation, you can either have a mutation in one of the genes or in both of the genes, because each of the chromosomes has an identical, not an identical, but has a copy of the gene. So that's sort of like where that comes from. And so what Todd described, he said he's homozygous, which means that not only did he have one abnormal factor five, but he has two abnormal factor fives. In other words, he has no normal factor five because both genes were abnormal. And that means he inherited one from his mom and one from his dad, because that's how you have two sets of genes. Um, so the reason why that's important is people that are heterozygous, or so they only have one abnormal copy at an increased risk, but the risk is lower. People that have two abnormal copies or have more than one abnormal gene. So you can have factor five, prothrombin gene, you know, there are many different proteins. So you could be compound, which means you can have abnormal factor five as well as abnormal prothrombin gene. So if you have more than one abnormal gene, either of the same or different, your risk is much, much higher because it gets compounded because there's no normal protein left in the body. And actually family history is also very important. And that's to some degree because it sort of tracks with the genetic history, but there are probably, we strongly believe that there are genes that we don't yet know or we haven't identified that are also contributing. So if a first degree family relative, mom, dad, which means you know, if you've had a blood clot, your siblings, your children, and your parents are automatically now at increased risk, whether or not there was a genetic factor identified just by virtue of that history. So the family history or personal history of thrombosis is tracking that genetic story. So that's that. 
Yeah. It, um, it, 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 so my the doctors that were dealing with my mom, it's not like they could tell me, hey, you're factor five Leiden because your mom is because it was 10 years away before that was discovered. Right. So this was around 83, 84. And I think factor five Leiden was discovered in about 94. But but she and I forgot to mention that she also had that perfect storm of risk factors to fire her clot off. Right. She was obese. She was almost 170 pounds overweight. She sat on the couch all day because she was depressed from what my dad do, did to her. So she didn't move a lot and she smoked. So there was three glaring risk factors that uh, triggered her clot and it was it was sudden death. So, yeah. But a lot of, yeah, a lot of factor five Leiden people out there and they, they may never even know it because they may never have an issue. And they may never have an issue because especially homos are heterozygous. So one copy, there is an increased risk, but the absolute risk is not that high. It's, right. it's very common. And it's only usually when it compounds with others that it leads to a blood clot. Right. But a person, a family history of thrombosis, regardless, is sort of considered to be an important risk factor. So it's one that you don't even need expensive genetic testing when you need to go to a doctor for it. You just, if you have it, it means your family members now have that risk factor because mm -hmm. you are the risk factor. Sounds horrible, mm -hmm. but you know what I'm saying. Right. No, uh, that's a great yeah. way to say it. It's a yeah. great way to yeah. put it. Um, um, what was the other part that you asked? Sorry. Oh, the other part was uh, for patients that are in need of, you know, Todd is a um, active yes. plotter yes. And, and Ted is unprovoked. They need to be on their anticoagulation. Procedures. Medicine. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, Direct oral anticoagulants like rivaroxaban and apixaban, we just talked about it. They have a very, sh they work amazingly well, but then they also leave the body as soon as you stop, not as soon, but very soon after you stop taking them because they have, they have a short sort of half-life. Um, and so you sort of actually decide based on what's the bleeding risk, what's the clotting risk for every patient. Now there is sort of our blanket recommendations based on what the average population is, but pretty much every patient like I have lots of patients on anticoagulants and if they're going for procedures, I have to ask what procedure are they going for and what's the actual bleeding risk of that procedure? So it's different if they're having like a, you know, a mole biopsy on their skin or a skin tag removed or, or, or piercing versus if they're having brain surgery or spine surgery mm -hmm. because the bleeding and the brain are bleeding the spine can like kill you. So sort of that helps decide where, and what's the thrombosis history? So if somebody's had like eight blood clots or just had a blood clot or had a really serious blood clot, uh, that means that their thrombosis risk, even on a short term of anticoagulation is really high. And so you're sort of trying to balance those two. That helps decide how much of a gap, like how clearly do you want these anticoagulants not to be, you know, even a little bit of anticoagulants. If you're going for brain surgery, you need to be totally free of anticoagulation. So what we would sometimes do is stop it maybe even five days before but then switch you on a really short acting one, something like heparin, which is intravenous or subcutaneous. And you can stop it two hours before the procedure. So you're sort of minimizing that period where you're off anticoagulation and yet you're off anticoagulation as much as you can to go in yeah. for the surgery so that you're avoiding bleeding. So this yeah. is this bleeding clotting sort of story. The vast majority of patients do not have seven blood clots. Uh, and do not clot with 48 to 72 hours of anticoagulation. So the, the general recommendations for something like a colonoscopy is 24 to 48 hours, uh, no anticoagulation. Again, it depends. If you're going for brain surgery, it's at least 48 to 72 hours. And if you're going for like a colonoscopy, and if you don't think they're going to remove a polyp or anything, and it's just like going in and coming out, it can be even 12 hours or 24 hours. So it sort of depends on the procedure. There's this discussion between the surgeon and, and the hematologist, uh, you know, if you're going for a cataract surgery, you don't need to stop it sometimes. If you're having it, like it, a fourth place, you don't need to stop it. The bleeding risk is low enough that you can just do it on it. Like, it, it seems like bleeding really varies from patient to patient. I mean, if somebody gets cut, I mean, I've had patients ask me in the group, look, I don't, I hardly even bleed and, I, and I'm on Xeralto. It must not be working. Well, it is working, but why, why is one person bleeding more than the other? Because it's, as the same thing that makes clotting complicated makes bleeding complicated because it's a complex process. It's all these proteins, all these cells. It's actually the same process. It's just like the other side of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And so variations in genetic factors and environmental factors make you more or less likely to clot. They also make you more or less likely to bleed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, throw in a larger person, the same dose of anticoagulation, how your body metabolizes the anticoagulation. Uh, it, and it is not an effective measure 
at least on a DOAC to say that, you know, I don't bruise and so it's not working or I do bruise and so it's working, like these things don't correlate with mm -hmm. actual true efficacy, which is preventing another blood clot. That's what you want. Right. And avoiding a serious bleed, which is that's what you don't want. Uh, those are the actual goals of anticoagulation. Um, and of course, tolerance is quite different, right? Like, I mean, we're talking about men. This is after all VT and he. Uh, men don't seem to notice bruises quite as much. You know, one of our common referrals in a hematology clinic is easy bruising. I have never seen a man come for easy bruising. It's not that they don't bruise. That, that, that's a good point because that's people say I bruise like crazy and I'm looking at, I'm like, I, I, I crash sometimes on my bike, this and that. I don't seem to bruise, but maybe I'm just not looking for the bruises. So like. some of it is skin texture, but some of it is also like, do you really care about it? Like, you know, like where is the bruising? Like what's happening? And like, I, I know it's VT and he doesn't mean, it doesn't give me permission to be sexist. So I would stop speaking, but it does. Get, <laughs> and it does. <laughs> Uh, Let's stop at that, shall we? So we have actually run over by a lot. We want to be very mindful of your time because we know you're in the hospital. Um, and we're not going to be able to get to questions tonight, so I apologize for that. However, we do have some poll questions, exit poll questions that we would like everyone uh, to take. And Todd, you are the king of poll questions. Yeah, let's see if I can remember to actually read the results this time. So <laughs> here you go, folks. VTE and he are poll questions, our exit poll if you're previously, I, I got to tilt my glasses, sorry. If you're previously, if you previously had a blood clot, did you receive information about your diagnosis upon discharge? Yes, no. If you've been diagnosed with a blood clot, were you offered to speak with a VTE care coordinator? Yes or no. Would you take advantage of the opportunity to have a VTE care coordinator if you, if it was offered to you? Yes or no. If you could just answer those real quick, of course, not available as uh, the third option and all those questions, but if you could answer each of those, we're going to give the responses real quick. All right. If you've previously had a blood clot, did you receive information about your diagnosis upon discharge? 52% said yes. 32% uh, said no. 15% not available. If you've been diagnosed with a blood clot, were you offered to speak with a VTE care coordinator? 0% yes. I, I was never offered that. 81% no. 19% not sure. And would you take advantage of the opportunity to have a VTE care coordinator if it were offered to you? Absolutely. 90% says yes. 0% said no. We need wow. to make sure. We need yeah. to start making sure that people are getting access yes. um, after they've had their blood clots. So. Sure do. That's that's disturbing right there. It is very disturbing. So, um Ted, thank you on behalf of all of us tonight. Your story is incredible. And we are so appreciative of you coming and sharing it here with us. And uh, thank you for being part of our family now, because I know you're out spreading the word. So and thanks for being in the support group, Ted. We really oh, love having I'm, you in there, my friend. I'm happy to do it both, both those things. I'm very grateful to the NBCA for helping me become more educated. And uh, uh, I'm just grateful to be here. Every day is a blessing. Um, the Lord's really taking great care of me to get me this far. So uh, I feel like I'm here to help. So anytime you'd like me to come back on for anything, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, I love you, brother. Thank thanks. You. Thanks well, for being here. Love you might, too, man. Uh, Thank you. We might get you on our podcast soon. So uh, Jen posted in the chat here, our podcast, we've got some really incredible stories and we really want people to, uh, to listen to them. So Please, I've got sorry. a good face for podcasts, so that'll work. I know we're in this. Hey, we're from radio. We we have faces. We have faces for radio, Ted. Let's let's talk. All right. And we want to thank uh, Rashad. Rashad, you were amazing and just a wealth yeah. of information. Thank we, you so much. We definitely want well, you to thank come you. on and share your information. It was fantastic. And Todd, you too. You're amazing, also. So. With that, we're going to say thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, and everybody. Next, next month, uh, PEP is compression. So that's a biggie. Everybody needs to come back for compression. See you later. Thanks, Leslie. Bye. Bye. Good night.